Welcome. You're tuned into Life is a Sacred Journey. Every week, we bring a new perspective to aging and caregiving. Here is your host, Michelle Pope. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the virtual neighborhood of Life is a Sacred Journey. My name is Michelle Pope, and I am the host of this platform where every Friday morning we come to you um, to share what's going on in the world of caregiving. Uh, we talk about stuff that's even happening just on the planet as, as fellow humanity. This morning, we are expecting a guest, uh, Brett Sweet. So um, he will join us at some, at some point uh, this morning. But I wanted to start off, first of all, um, I've been thinking about Thanksgiving. Many of you know um, that Thanksgiving uh, is one of those holidays that I kind of have had a love-hate relationship with. One, I like the, the, the theme of, of Thanksgiving, gratitude, gratefulness, saying I'm thanking people, um, family getting together. But I also have felt like we shouldn't have to have a holiday to tell people how grateful we are and, and to say thank you. So I'm now saying um, happy gratitude season uh, instead of happy Thanksgiving, because I think um, politically uh, Thanksgiving for me kind of is, is weird in a, in, the, in a sense because we're giving thanks, but then there's a group of people who um, got oppressed because of Thanksgiving. So I think we're just looking at a season of gratitude, but I wanna take it further and say, we should be grateful every day. We shouldn't have to wait for a holiday to come to tell us to be grateful. When every morning when I get up and I put my feet to the ground, I know that I am alive and I am grateful. So I'm not telling you, because I know you. some people out there always think that somebody's telling you what to do and that we're trying to take away your freedom. No, no, no. What I'm telling you <laughs> is that gratitude shouldn't just be celebrated two days out of the year, is what I'm telling you. And we should really have a gratitude attitude every single day. Uh, and so Brett Sweet is one of the people that helps me to be grateful. And the reason that he does is because he is a person in the community that has a vision for the community that means humanity and individuals coming together to live out their best selves. He does that um, as the director of the Renaissance uh, Entrepreneurship Center. He, um, they help to launch and ma maximize new and existing Bay Area small businesses. And, and he did that um, because he, he saw the need. Uh, one, we all know that when all of our small businesses, our mom and pops, as we used to call them, are thriving, they are the, the, the foundation to a lucrative community. And so if we can support small business owners by giving them the education that they need, by teaching them about finance, you know, um, you know, we, we can't live in a caste system where only somebody who has an MBA gets the right to start a business. And so um, Brett is one of those individuals that understands that and knows that it is about the passion and the vision that the individual has that must be fostered. And then he is his center and, and he are giving people the skills to see that through. That's what hope is, you guys, is when we see it from the lens of giving people hope and then just giving them all the tools they need to live out their best hope. Um, also, I have to say, Brett is also a writer. Um, I am, am honored and blessed that I own one of his books. It, it is an amazing book. Uh, it has a sci-fi edge to it, and it has superheroes that look like me. Um, and so I actually had the honor of giving that to my son, who shares that uh, DNA with me as a gift. Uh, so hopefully he'll be bringing it on December 4th, which we'll talk about in a minute so he can get Brett to autograph it personally. Um, and then Brett had a dad, as we all had dads, right? Or we wouldn't be here. But I want to um, say something to Brett and say to you uh, as we are all be as we're beginning our conversation, what I realized in writing the, the words for the long goodbye 
yes, there were some sad moments in the wordings that are used in this in this glorious album that has been created, which we will be um, having a party about on December 4th. We'll get into that in a minute. But what I realized is that he was also celebrating an intentional relationship between father and son and son and father. He was speaking of a history where a father spanked his butt and told him to do well, where a father showed an example of manhood and kingdom that was like, wow, and created this man, Brett Sweet, who now says, yeah, my dad had dementia, but I didn't lose him really. I created a new relationship with my dad and now I wanna celebrate that relationship. That is the caregiver experience, folks. And when you can do that, then yes, there's the grief and the doom and the gloom of the disease and all of that. I'm not gonna take that away from you because that's our humanity. But we have to celebrate the lives of the people that are living with this disease, as well as those that go on to glory or wherever your beliefs believe that they go. And so today, this morning, Life is a Sacred Journey is well is so honored to welcome back, not the first time, to welcome back Brett Sweet and uh, my brother and friend. Uh, welcome. It's so good to have you with us. Namaste. And um, let's get into it. Good morning. <laughs> You are so good at this, Michelle. Well, I love you. You're so good at this. I I hope you appreciate it. I wish I had had you at the memorial. You are just so good at this. At some well, uh, you know, I live in the spirit and I live in the heart. And yeah. so when you live in the spirit and you live in the heart, I, 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 I speak from there. You know, I know that makes a lot of people sick, as you know, in my world, because they want me to be cognitively always on and to speak from yes. my academia. But yes, they have brain understand. all day, Excel and yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can yes. do all that, right? I sure. can do all that. But thank God, at sixty-four years old, I understand I can do what I want now. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think I that's choose to speak and live from the heart. So right. for those that that offends, I'm sorry. Uh, but for those that can get on the train with me, welcome aboard and welcome to Life is a Sacred Journey. Hit the share button, call somebody, get your coffee, get your tea, and let's get started uh, with this wonderful conversation with my dear brother and friend, Brett Sweet. So Brett, I want to first of all talk about Renaissance because I think the reason that you're engaged and, and the reason that that, plat, that is a part of your life has a lot to do with your dad. And so, um, and, and some of the, the foundation and blocks that he left for you um, and you're living out your manhood as a son, as a husband, a friend, a colleague. So can you talk about the work at Renaissance and the vision and mission there and kind of, you know, who you serve? Sure, uh, Renaissance is um, about 30, going on 40 year old uh, organization. <laughs> social purpose organization, nonprofit, depending on how you look at it, right? Um, and essentially its mission has been to make sure that anybody who wants to start a business can start a business. But if you, you know, you know a thing or two about nonprofits, um, you can tell a different tale by looking at the client base and the outputs. And the outputs say, what we do successfully for 30 years is help individuals who have been historically um, challenged and prevented from being part of the structural economy yeah. and helping them participate. And who is that? That's women. Mm -hmm. That's uh, BIPOC, Black, African American, whatever term you're going to use today that doesn't upset you, you know? <laughs> uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, Latin E, right? Same, same categories. Indigenous, same category. uh, Asian Pacific Islander, LGBTIA. Yes. Um, handicapped, formerly incarcerated, and oh, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, and, yeah, seniors, and vastly lower income. Uh, vastly no lower income by both federal guidelines and HUD guidelines. Okay, so we're not we're not talking about the kid who drops out of an Ivy League school to go start some tech startup. We're talking about where do your favorite spending per week go to? Right, that coffee shop you love. 
the bakery. Yep. Yep. Um, the, the homeowner, the, or no, excuse me, the, the home repair shop, the plumber, all of these are individuals who come with these great technical skills that they trained over two decades or they learned. But there's not, you're not going to go to, for example, just because we live by it, you're not going to go to UC Berkeley after me, after getting your contractor's license to set up a, a con, you know, right, instead yeah, of a painting yeah. business. That's not what it is. Yeah. So where do you figure that out? Well, you just go out into business and then you find out the hard way. You're not making any money. Right. We bridge that gap. And so what we do is we create a community-based business school that we run very much more like an institute. Oh. Um, uh, and I run my, my sites a little bit different. Mines are a little bit more like sort of martial arts studios where you can drop in. Oh, um, okay. but, ten, but typically what will happen is they're energetically a little bit more like an urgent care unit, right? And what do I mean by that? When people come to urgent care, they have an immediate problem. They okay. brought their son in and their son's ankle has swollen up and they, they're begging you not to cut your kid's leg off. <laughs> and after talking to them for a while and bandaging it, you explain the concept of rolling your ankle and soft tissue and swelling. And then now that I've got the trust, I can talk to you about maybe your son should not be playing soccer in a field full of gopher holes. <laughs> right. Very, right. Very much. Right. Good idea. <laughs> yeah, right. So now I can get you into proactive thinking and preventative. And that's very much what we do with businesses. It's okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You needed this grant. You needed this loan because COVID came. Fine, we can help you. But now that we've done that and I've earned your trust, let us hire you a consultant who will help you set up your QuickBooks. Oh. Let's, yeah, let's, let us hire a coach who will meet with you monthly so you could talk about yes. bookkeeping and finance. Because that's not what you, you didn't get into that. You came into me, you know, you made the, the illest pies in your church for 20 years. You thought it was just about selling slang and pie. You didn't sign up for that. There. Um, so that's what we do is we help people conceptualize the back end. Um, to quote, you know, there's a great book about a small business called the E-Myth. And I think it's one oh, of those yeah, timeless yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. If you know, you know, right? Yeah. Uh, it's one of those timeless truths. He talks about working in your business and working on your business. I think most, most of these small business micro entrepreneurs, that's the term we call them. Yep. Micro entrepreneur means you have the owner, Plus employees, less than six people. They make less than a million dollars in, in profit, right? Which is maybe 80% of the U.S. economy. That's right. Then when you add in the say. small businesses that make, you know, that's got 20 or less people, that brings it up to 99%. So yep. one of the biggest misconceptions is it's like, oh, it's the Pandoras and Clorox and Googles that really make the economy. Nope. Less than a cat whisker, right? So, yep. um, but yep. these individuals... Once you get them going and you talk to them about it, you're essentially teaching them how to work in the business and on the business. Most of the micro entrepreneurs, they love to work in the business. I'm going to keep making soup. Yep. I'm going to sell you soup for $10. How much does yep. soup cost? I don't know. I'm going to sell you soup for $10. Okay. Then you're going to do the books. Oh, soup costs $15. Right? It's funny. Then the reverse happens and they go upstream and they become a small business. They expand. Yep. And then they work on the business. They don't work in the business. Anymore. Yeah, They're all about making recipes, but they forgot. Yes. Does the soup taste good anymore? Our job is to help them. So we do that through four primary programs. Oh, we do I training. Love I love that. Um, we do advising. And so uh, we do access, which, uh, which can be capital. And then we also do marketplaces okay. um, where we help them bring in new types of uh, customers. Uh, and, 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 and more recently, you know, we've done, we've expanded some of that. Um, access before may have just meant, hey, we're going to go and talk to these nonprofit lenders and get you a next to zero interest loan. Because, oh, I see. Okay. Yes, because Michelle, we can check some boxes here. You're a woman, yeah. you're a person of color. You're, every box that we check of your demographic, the interest rate goes lower. Yep. Because you're going to start a business in your community, right? Um, what we found over the pandemic is that also we need to be giving out grants because when your business is sinking and no customers are coming in, we need a runway of money, not money you need to pay back. You just need money. Okay? That's right. We also found that we had to give you, find a way to give you laptops and Chromebooks because you were convinced and lied to that this is a computer. Right. Right. Okay. That's right. And um, it's not. You know, we talked about this. And so oh, we did it because it, Brett, you know, when, when, when the pandemic hit, 
when we began to say to people, we'll go online to find a clinic to even get the vaccine, we realized in many communities that that was isolating because there was no bandwidth in those communities. And we're not just talking urban, we're talking about some ur rural, 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 rural. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And, and one thing we can say about technology in America is the people who build it seldom use it. And then they tend to be very dismissive about it. Oh, just so simple. And you've had this moment. You, everybody here has gone to that customer service and you go, well, okay. just click on this. And you go, I'm clicking on it. There's right. nothing there. And they're like, let me share your screen. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. They're always confused. And you're like, why do you think I've been on the call with you for three hours? It, right? Well, and the thing that I don't like about it, they get almost frustrated with you. Right. Like, because like it's because again, they're there. And I'm like, if the button isn't there. there. <laughs> and they're following a script, but they never, nobody hired them to check and say, before you send out the script, does it exist? I think the only people who really do that is like hospitals, like, like Kaiser. They check their scripts, right? right. They're like, okay. You know, I can't put a, a checklist to tell you to wash hands in right. a building that doesn't have bathrooms. So right. we won't do it. You know what I mean? Um, so we do that. We've added in the technology piece and under advising. One thing that we added, we used, we, we still have our coaching programs where we hire consultants to work one-on-one, -on -one, but we also added in a mentorship program. Um, you and I being on Zoom comes natural. Yeah. And you're a great open-minded individual. But if we think about some of your peer group, you know, I, I ain't trying to be, well, what is this? Who wants to see me on camp, right? This is yeah. new to them. So we need them to meet with a college student who has the time to get them used to talking on Zoom. Oh, so that comes natural. That. Yeah, so we that. do that. Our trainings, we've moved from being in person to being online. And now we're going to explore some of the hybrid models, some yeah. of it in person, some of it stored curriculum, right? That you could always nice. tell trying to figure that out. So, you know, we've expanded and that's a lot of what we do. So I essentially run... Our offices, uh, Alameda County and Contra Costa County, which, oh, okay. as you know, we've talked about um, yeah. county size wise, seven and eight out of the third largest state and one of the largest economies in the world. So it's I a know. very different perspective. And as I you know. and I, we always talk about, um, you know, you can spend a day driving through Alameda. You can spend a day driving through Contra Costa. So to try to paint them with the same brush is very is a, is a huge mistake. Um, they're, they're a bunch of micro towns. Oh, absolutely. And it's so interesting to me because what you're saying, I'm finding out, you know, my daughter is in the process of looking for apartments around the East Bay. You know her very well. You guys yeah. work together. And I'm and trying to find her apartments in the East Bay. And you're looking from yeah. neighborhood to neighborhood and it's vastly different and it's only a two steps away. And you're just like, how can that be? But then you begin to see as you're going through certain areas, also the influx of money. And then yes. on the opposite side, just across the street, the people are who are trying to hang on. And so there's th there's yes. this, this uh, cornucopia of, of yeah. uh, cash. Right I'm right. going to call it cash because that's what it is, that, that you visually begin to see when you're beginning to look for shelter. And Absolutely. why then the uh, the tents that we see are growing up everywhere? Because and you you begin to see that disparity in, yes. in in everything. And if you don't have shelter, um, and then you or you are, are like you're saying an entrepreneur who's just starting out and you're trying to figure out you get hit with the pandemic and you're right. like you say you don't have the capacity like I did to go and get a PPP loan lickety split. Or, what does PPP mean? What was what, that? Is that a new gang? Oh, is that, exactly. what are they talk, right? Like they talk to people like it's all been decided and that they don't have to break this down. And it's amazing that I've said this since the beginning of social media and public policy, like going back to 2008 and nine and the stimulus. It's like the most negative has a YouTube channel, but the stuff that's useful doesn't. There's no baby step in here. There's no like, hi. Sign up today and let me explain to you what a stimulus package works for you, right? The other thing that you brought up is really interesting is the inputs don't make any sense anymore, okay? Yeah. There's generally an inverse equation. High crime, low rent. It ain't happening. It's not fixing it, you know? We're, we're seeing crime rise and the rent ain't dropping. And you're like, excuse me, hello. Wait, that, I thought that was the grand bargain here, right? Exactly. Like, right? And but so it's not. It's not. 
And so then it makes you suspicious. But I mean, we could we could talk that all day. But I think right, a lot right. of it has to do with, um, for me in a certain way, becoming, you know, that kind of extension of my father and his father's work, which is being a bit of a farmer, being a bit of a gardener. And, and where we come from, what that means is understanding that there's a part of it that's human capital and a part of it that's the actual the physical seeds that you sow. Um, but understanding that when that's needed, right? So like my grandfather not only had a farm, but he also built the, the community store, the dry food store, because he started the town. There was nothing there. And right. as a thing I often talk to clients about is, are you selling water in the desert, right? So let's just take the strip between where I live and where ASEB is. How many more coffee shops do we need? <clears throat> How much more ice cream do we need? College kids ain't drinking ice cream. I ain't drinking coffee anymore. They yeah. drink energy drinks. Right. Ice cream, maybe they'll stay up until two in the morning, but that was pre-pandemic. Right. And so these concepts of like, well, this has got to work. Yeah. It's got to work. There's already three coffee shops. I'll just put one next door. And it's like, it's not that different than a mentality of thinking this dude on the corner is slinging this. So I'm going to sling it next to him. And if he gets in my way, I'll shoot him. You're both going to lose through danger and risk. Yes. Um, yeah. I feel like that's some part of the work that I've, I, I'm trying to do is take these people with great ideas and also take these people with great determination and put them in the communities that need them the most, but also do it in a way yes. where they're not regulated to this. And as we've talked about, this permanent servant class that I'm not a fan of at all yeah. that says that yeah. you're here to make coffee for me for the next 40 years, yeah. right? Yeah. And your yeah. son, your sons and daughters will be coffees, you know, and yeah. after a while, we'll change your last name to Coffee Son. Or, you know what I mean? Like, you know, your daddy was a blacksmith. You always going to be a blacksmith. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. going to be a knight. Yeah. I'm going to be yeah. a knight. I swing I a sword it. harder than you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, That's the I promise do. that we were told in this country. Yeah. And so we always have to keep challenging. And so well, we um, have to keep challenging because also uh, we've got to give people better avenues of of self sustainability. 100%. And and you 100%. know I just recently read an article where you know for the last decade we've been pushing kids to go to community colleges not and and they're coming out now with uh, saying guess what I took a bunch of classes that uh, that I'm not able to use them to get into a four year college. Accreditation is very, very, yeah, we can, let me know when you want to talk about that. We could eat up a whole pot, you know, I used to- We could eat up the whole pot, but, but, but those things are the reason that your dad did what he did, your grandfather did in the community to, yes. to create that what I have back here, the equal balance, the equal balance between society, societal stuff, money, the yeah. law, our spirit, that balance. And when you do that, then you create not only for yourself, but you create for others. My, my friend, Steve Schallenberger, a shout out to Steve Schallenberger and his book, uh, Do What Matters Most, that he did with his son, Robert. It, yeah. he, I just recently had an opportunity to be with him. Um, and he was just talking about everything we do is like planting one pumpkin seed. Yes. You plant that pumpkin seed. I mean, in, in faith based, we talk about the mustard seed, but using a pumpkin as a visual that when you bust that pumpkin open after it grew from the one seed, every quadrant of the pumpkin has 280 seeds in it. So right. from one person thinking about, wait a minute, let's equalize the community and create community. Yes. Uh, uh, in its true sense. And then do it in a way that I'm, I benefit because I grow, I learn, I feel good about my existence, but then so does everybody else around me. And what happens when everything is flourishing? People yep. have a different mentality. Yep. We have a different spirit of heart. We're not yep. running into a store with hammers and breaking the, the, the stuff and stealing the money. We're not doing that. We're not yep. doing those kinds of things because we know that person behind the counter is our neighbor. Right. And, and also it becomes clearer to see when, if it does happen. We can't stop it. We understand the difference between my neighbor and this person just doesn't care. And that's where it's gotten very scary recently, where the lines have been blurred, where, to your point, you know, you think it's the threat of that person who lives down near the street who busted up your shop. When we look back at it, we find out consistently people are driving for at least 20 to 40 minutes. And you can map that. 
yeah, and figure yeah. out where that is. So that ain't yeah, your neighbor. Yeah. That's somebody who's decided from another county, I'm going to go take. And, and, it, and then you shouldn't have the same rules about paranoia of who's a threat, right? Exactly. Um, but but so that's easier to move, see from your point. Yeah, exactly. And before we move into the event, though, because you always bring out these these wisdom moments for me, I every time I talk to you, I could talk to you for hours. Um, in the African tradition, yes, when a person was um, doing bad things within the village, the back of the village uh, people was turned on that person and they were not allowed to live among the village until they changed their behavior. Right, right. So we have to stop fostering people, loved ones, siblings, community. We have to stop fostering behavior that we know is wrong. It is wrong, it has never been right, it will never be right, it's wrong and wrong and wrong. And we have- And that doesn't have to be jail. And, and that no. doesn't have to be skiding on somebody on social media. That could just be like, you know you can't come to dinner here anymore. You know you gotta make this right. You know that, right? Exactly. You know not, exactly. you know, or the, the class you. when you and I were raised with, right? Like, you know not to come in my house with new shoes when you owe money. You know that, right? You know that, right? Exactly. Till we said, yeah, we got that. Or yeah. And, so when you pay me back, I'm going to take those shoes. Thank you very much. Have a good day. But we're afraid to do that because we're afraid, you know, we're we're afraid, afraid to do that. We lost, we lost our way. We, we, for somehow, someone convinced us that didn't work. Well, but it's love. That's the yes. other thing I realize in writing. Yes. Um, I'm writing, finally finishing up this book. And Lovely. love is to me the catalyst to it all because my mother loved me. Yes. She made me, held me accountable to a higher level of standard that yes. was so high that guess what? I didn't probably make it before she died, but I was damn near, I was damn close. I get it. I get it. Well, you know, we, we've talked about this. Yeah, 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 so yeah. We're going to move to... <laughs> well, it's a great segue, right? Because... Yeah, it's um, a great segue. It's a great segue. It's, it's, it's part of that. And, it, and it, it's... it's um, Love is not always whispers to your lower self, Ooh, right? Say that again, my brother. Oh my love God. is not always whispers to your lower self. It's not always, you know, hey, love is not always because you saw me naked. Love is not always because I throw a good party and, and let and master and help you expand your addictions. Love is not always because I let you lose control. Sometimes love is, hey, I care deeply about you, but if you say something like that again in front of this house. I will knock you silly and I will still take you to the hospital. I love you dearly. And that's why I cannot let you say that about yourself. Yes. And that's, and, and, and we, we need to recontextualize that and understand that love is that, 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 that there's so much nuance between some color purple bullying and abuse, yes. right. Yes. And between enabling and co-signing nonsense that love, can, love and accountability go hand in hand. And we shouldn't be afraid of it, but you hit the nail on the head. If you don't know what love is, if you don't really know what love is, um, my dad was, for me, the most emotionally intelligent human being I ever met. And what I mean by that is, and we've had this convo, you, you know, I used to take my dad to ASAP, you know, this tiny, tiny midget of a man, you know, you couldn't, was he, was he, was he highly Selassie or was he a pygmy? You couldn't figure it out, right? one eyed and he could look at you and start saying something. And yeah. you're, 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 you know, as the young people would say, you, you, you go to the ancestral plane, like your soul would jump out of your chest, out of your back real quick. You're like, Ooh, no. let's not push it with him. He would, he would whoop the out of me. Yeah. And then right after he'd be crying. I'm disappointed, Brett, that you took me to this level that I have to explain the boundary to you. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm crying. Because I feel like I wrote out a legal pen, right? He's a lawyer. I explained this all to you. Here are all the places that caught you in the lie. I gave you six times to back out of it and apologize. Yes. You yes. kept doubling down. Yes. So I have to show you a boundary. Yes. And I'm crying because I think you are smart enough. No, I know you're smart enough not to walk this road. Yes. And I've said this to you and I've said it to many people. And I think I see a lot of my dad and myself now because he used to say, 
you know, his dad was just a mean old black tyrant, right? And I used to say that about my dad, and then I thought he was too hard on me. Yeah. And given everything I've seen over the last five years, Michelle, I don't know if he was hard enough. I think my father, that, I think that's why I've lived through, I'm living through a pandemic. I think that's why I've lived through uh, drive-by shootings Absolutely. and crack epidemics and things like that. Because my father was willing at any given time to go to that level and keep me accountable, but also do it in a very loving way. Um, oh, and, and so in the long goodbye, yes, you, you, you have taken words, you know, we're both the, you and I are lovers of words because yes. we understand and we unpack them. One of the things that I think people don't um, do enough of is to unpack them. And right here in my office, I have my dictionary and my thesaurus right here. Every time I'm writing, every time I'm doing something, because I always am revisiting the meanings yeah. of things because the meanings have been distorted and used in ways people don't even know what they're I also about. think that's the consciousness that we, without going there, that you brought with you from New York and that I kind of went back and studied under where if you, you must break a word down into its pieces. You know what I'm getting at? That culture, yes. Yeah. Well, don't use that word if you don't know what it's made up of. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. You know, um, my first, uh, I was telling Brett, you guys, because the music that the that Brett has, the genre is is uh, rap and a lot of people or spoken word and a lot of people mixed in with a little bit of hip hop. And and the thing that people do not understand, unless you come from back east, New York, the Bronx, and those areas, is that the hip hop music of today is not the rap music of the past or the spoken word. I grew up around poets that, that, the, that took words to describe the human condition and the long goodbye, which Brett, I don't even know, how long did it take you to compose this, to write this? Let me try to recreate it because I've yeah, never do that put it the pieces together. Yeah. Um, so to give some background for your audience, uh, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's on my 27th birthday in 2005. And anybody who's gone through the mental test knows how disruptive that is to the family. And they said, given the early onset, he probably had about two years to live. Um, and it's sort of, I think that day it sort of started to eradicate the Brett suite I was at that time. Uh, you know, I was being torn apart. Um, then um, because of that, uh, I think there's something you said that I really resonate with, which was like, I have to make it. I have to show this man that I get it and I have two years. And so, and my father being a civil rights attorney, he made me write a contract. He literally told me, I might let you take care of me if you do these things. And one of the bullet points was, I had dropped out of business school and he wanted me to go back to business school because he thought I was smart enough. And because I had tried, he, he knew that if I applied myself and he also, I realized in retrospect, did not want me to give up my life to be a caregiver. And so I started business school, August of 2007. Um, and then the, and then the great recession started. Okay. And so the stress of that, as my father's decline was happening, he hadn't passed away, but his decline was getting serious. And I was, I was, I was balancing either taking him to the hospital or dealing with his illnesses in the ER, you know, or, or him escaping from our house and us looking for him and then going around and looking at different care facilities and trying to wrap my brain around that and taking finals and learning classes and trying to make money. Right. And, um, in 2005, I officially decided I'm never going to do music. I'm done doing hip hop. And in fact, I decided to myself, this was such a, the biggest waste of my time. This is one of the greatest failures. If I had not been doing this rap stuff, maybe I would have gone to med school and I could have cured this disease. Uh, okay. I literally told myself these very self-destructive messages. Um, so I blamed my lifestyle. And I also... In the beginning of being a caregiver, I had to learn overnight, you know, like the lifestyle I used to have as, as working in the music industry, work started at 11 o'clock at night and ended at five in the morning, right? Because you're promoting. Oh, wow. Night. So that totally changed. I mean, I very quickly, you know, you here's a, a science for anybody who's been a caregiver. 
if you leave your house in San Francisco at five in the morning to pick up your father at Lakeside Park and get him to an appointment at Kaiser by nine o'clock and you're late three times in a row, that's not traffic. That's because you're an alcoholic. Mm. You just got to have some moment in them. You just got to look in the mirror. And that's what I did. I literally went to Ikea and I bought this armor. It's about six feet tall. Okay. And, it was, and I put all my suits in it, but it was covered in mirrors. And I just sat there when, and after doing some work with the therapist and I would make sure I knew when I was lying to myself. Wow. Right? That I had, had, I had built this part of my brain and my personality that had enabled me into fooling myself. Woo. Because so much of entertainment, regardless of what art form you come from, there's a part of selling art that is sort of about taking on characters and then art imitates life. Yes, yes. So I had to go through that and I just decided I don't need that side of my brain. So I kind of like, I have that weird ability and I sort of done a psychic scalpel and just, <laughs> we don't need the rapper. That's the problem, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And everything that was associated with rap, I transformed. So my studio, I only use to record vocabulary words and math problems. So I could, on my commute, I could study for the GMAT. Okay, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, I just transformed no, I it. I've done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I went through all that. And then I was going through finals. And I watched the Great Recession. And my father had stored up a good amount of money. And I watched his money disappear from these, these Wall Street banks. Mm -hmm. I watched the money that I had made in the music industry paying for it. And it wasn't just my father. My mo mom at the same time was crippled. She was in yeah, another. Yeah, I, I knew that. So my money was just all this, this wealth that I had grown. I mean, Kaiser was just eating it for lunch. And I was up late at night and, and not taking care of myself and chain smoking and living off coffee, cigarettes, and an occasional bagel. I think even sometime around 2008, uh, I was also launching a restaurant oh. and I was really working hard on the Obama campaign. So I decided because I had so many nightmares that it was just not worth it to sleep because between the nightmares and then taking my dad and my mom to the hospital, what's the point? And I fooled myself into that habit. And then I just stopped sleeping. Oh, wow. So I had a moment. I must have done something. But I, two of my friends I used to make music with, they must have heard something in my, my email or my voice yeah. that made them super concerned. I don't know what it was. But at the same day, they both said they went and plugged in old beat machines that they hadn't used in five years that were still dusty. They made something and they sent it to me. And they said, I think you need to write. Something just told me you need to write because I'm worried yeah. about you. And so there was two songs that I would just listen to as instrumentals over and over again. So that's 2008. And then I actually, for one of my projects in my business school class, I tried to explain in this creativity, I played this, the template of one of these songs to explain. I just wrote on the whiteboard and I was explaining how Alzheimer's, my father was changing. You know, got to have the whole room crying, you know, standing ovation, all these things. But I was also realizing something was here. This was relating. And then my father passed away in 2010. Right. And, um, you know, that was a really hard time for me, obviously, you know, still, still, you know, still something I'm processing. Yeah. Um, and my wonderful fiance at the time, now my wife. Your wife, yeah. She, you know, was, was a pianist. And in the apartment we had, we couldn't fit her piano and she had my beat machines and she was just making music. And she says, you need to write more about this. You have to get this out of your system. Yeah. And so she just made a deal because, you know, as you, you know, my relationship, I don't argue with my wife. It's just more of what she says. And I do. <laughs> and you She's like, we're, yeah, you're going to every feeling that you have, you're going to write a feeling out. And then we're going to turn that into a song till you get this out of your chest. You're going to yeah. expel this is phlegm. And so that process happened. And so maybe that was 2010 to 11. Everything got finished writing. And then because we have day jobs, we're not full time rapper musicians. This is a passion. We kind of would work on this three hours a week. Oh, wow. On Friday nights, we tweak it, tweak it, tweak it. So then that process, it was all recorded, but we were just kind of, she would add in music and a lot of her process without giving away the secret sauce, which was brilliant. Yeah, give away the secret sauce. <laughs> because she's a composer, she can hand me something to start with, and then I write, and then she literally composed to every single word and voice. Mm. So literally, the lyricism that you detected, she wrote music to it, and oh. that expanded. I didn't know that. You didn't tell me that part. Yeah, and That's I think, I think the, the most, 
I think you really see that in the song The Long Goodbye, which I think is probably the most complete. But I think when we started that process, I said, you see this scene? This is the final scene of Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, you see how Judas just comes out and sings the song? Yeah. That's what I want to do. And so I wrote it, and it was literally just the bass line. Oh, my gosh. And I recorded it. And then when I came back, I was just like, oh, my. When I That's heard amazing. what she had done. Yeah, and the earphones, I was like, you know, yeah. and I think, so that was a lot of the album. And then it took us another three years to find the right, you know, we got a mixer and a master. So then it was a, a six year process, but that's all in these different segments so, of conception. Um, and, we're, and then so also cool. figure out what do we want to do with it? Because, you know, there's a, there was labels who wanted me to put it out, but I was like, I don't, I don't want to be that. Yeah. To be honest, it comes back to what you said. And I'm glad you, you brought it up. I had some missions with this part personally was like, I wanted to give a soundtrack to other caregivers. Oh, I wanted man. something that they could put on in the car at five in the morning and put their parent in and go deal with those, those appointments. We don't ever, nobody ever asks you, you know, there's no, you know, there's no Calendly. There's no like, Oh, let's look at your schedule and my schedule and find out when the blood draw can happen when you're on your lunch break. None of that. It's always in competition with your day job. Yep. There's no, there's no flexibility. Nope. So if I'm figuring, I'm seeing all these people and they have to do, and that's why your program is so important because it buys people time to drop off a parent while they go and make money to take care of their parent. That's right. It's like, I wanted to give them something instantly when they feel like there's nothing left, when they're exhausted, put in the CD, turn on whatever, plug in the aux cord, sweets here, this long, this, this, will, this will sustain me. This yes. is an hour and 30 minutes that's going to handle my drive whether I'm delivering bread or I do FedEx or whatever I have to do to get to this meeting, yep. this guy's got me. And that there's a community here. The other piece of it I was it. my first album. I had a skit where I was making fun of these wealthy Berkeley Hills, Oakland Hills kids who thought they could rap yeah. because their parents were buying them equipment. Yeah. And my dad heard him. He said, Hey, uh, my dad was so hip. He was like, are you dissing me? <laughs> Dude, I shotted you out on the first and the last song. What do you? Yeah. But you, you're a parent. If someone asks you, it's because that's what how they felt, and they don't. They, they, they're letting it go. But that's what he heard. Yes. He wasn't here to receive it, but I wanted to make sure that if I did a whole album, that's the opposite of being dissed. The other piece of it was um, maybe it's the Gemini me, maybe it's the South Berkeley in me. <laughs> I understand that I've had a vengeful streak. I'm a good person. I'm a superhero, but I don't let it go. When you cross me, when you do dirty things to poor people, I don't let it go. And I just couldn't get it out of my brain. I just, I, I, I prayed on it. I worked on so much spiritual stuff. I've been so much better about it, but there's just one enemy. I can't let it go, which is Alzheimer's. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, no, that's my enemy. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not. And I just feel like we got all this time to cancel everything. How about we cancel Alzheimer's? Right. Do we get it? Right. Right. Like, oh, and what you talked about, caring for the caregiver, you know, make yes. it possible for appointments to be in the evening so that the working caregiver can can go to work or the caregiver who needs to go home and take a four hour nap that yeah. they can take, bring their loved one in at seven for a doctor's appointment. Everything is done around the convenience of the care the of that professional space yeah. that needs to shift to what is needed for the caregiver. Just like the other day we were sitting here at the round table and we made the decision, oh my goodness, why don't we open up on a Saturday from 10 to three or 10 to four and say, if you wanna go do your holiday shopping, go have lunch right. with a friend, bring your lunch, we'll come and get them on right. the Saturday and bring them back home. Who, who could have thought that that would have been something? Then we had the vision. What if we had a couple of bedrooms up here? We could have offered somebody New Year's Eve. And so what Brett is offering to you and to me is on December 4th, we are having a open house yeah. holiday festival. We are calling that because we didn't want everybody to think it was just like a normal fundraiser. We want to create a community. And, and Brett and I first thought about it as a block party because our New York days when in uh, Boston back- And we wanted to be safe. 
We wanted to wanted open to air and look, you can be social distanced and masked up. And we're going to be outside. And we're going to have the, the yes, building yes. open for you to walk in and out. Windows will be open, air purifiers, yeah. but we're going to decorate this area here uh, around us. It's going to be a holiday festival. So Brett is donating um, the some of the proceeds from the CD. Um, you will Most be Let's just be honest. Most of it. <laughs> yeah, most of it. Yeah, get everything. Yeah, yeah. I think it's ten dollars. Is that right? Well, I think that the idea of what I want to do is, um, I mean, I do have some costs along the way just to yeah. maintain it. Like for example, you websites cost money. People don't right. realize this, right? So my thought is, uh, if you spend a dollar to buy a single, I'll put, I'll give ninety cents out of that dollar to okay. to so uh, they can buy ASAP, it. Okay. Which. We and I know, and because we work in this field in philanthropy, nobody else is doing that. Right. I don't happen when you give to Red Cross, and that and Red Cross does great work, but nobody else is giving that deal. Right. So my thought was the music stands on its own, and um, I guess one point I wanted to go back to now that you mentioned it, I thought that I wanted to prove something to my dad about how I made it. Now that I had the, like a lot of people do not understand, like. Yeah, I have two MBAs. Yeah, I built this. I've done this. Like, I got a portfolio site. You can understand I'm no joke when it comes to, like, building things. and no, you're not. You're not. But I'm also one of the best rappers to ever live. And that needed to come out. And that wasn't going to come out because I had made the mistake of, again, cutting that out of my brain. And I wanted to show that and say, this, if I couldn't make this work for my lifestyle, I can at least transfer this energy and apply it to something that does work well, which I think mm -hmm. how we started this combo, when you start this as a caregiver, most of your logic is going to be pulled away from you. It doesn't make sense for you why the mother who told you to eat your vegetables doesn't want to eat vegetables. Anymore. Yeah. You have to let go of that. We've talked about this at, you know, at yeah, length. So you start tapping into that intuition. Yeah. And I wanted to give a message to other people that they had the same abilities, that I'm not just the only, I'm not special, that you could take these other skills from other places and they'll make you fantastic caregivers. And that skill that you have as a caregiver will make you an incredible leader at your job. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I wanted to prove that and show that. And with a very, a, 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 a audio museum kind of exposition. This is, this is my black belt. This is my swan song, right? This is my, uh, I just watched this fan, you know, you and I always trade notes about great documentaries. I just watched this fantastic Miles doc I'll send you. Yeah. But uh, this is, you know, this is my, um, this is my sketches of Spain. Right. You know, this well, is my love supreme and being able, this is my equimini, right? Yeah. This is my only built for Cuban links and supreme clientele to be able to hand this out and say, you may enter this process as a caregiver feeling like you're behind the ball, but by the time you're over, you will have, have added superpowers. I, I promise. And I'm living proof of that. And don't give up hope. And we're going to support you and take care of you every way. Oh and so that was a lot of it. And so I wanted to make sure that even my friends who learned about me through rap, there's somebody who's going to listen and go, this is an incredible album. And they don't know what Alzheimer's is. Yep. And in that way, yep. maybe we can change and get ahead of this in very much the same way that, People are looking at how do we get ahead of COVID? How do we get ahead of HIV? I want us to be able to talk about this because one of the problems I have with the disease is that it hides in secret. Yeah. We, use, we use words to hide from. You and I come from a generation where we say, oh, Granny's, you know, Granny, you know, Gang Gang is just senile. Still senile. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we don't see the connections. We don't understand it. Maybe we can't eat like that anymore. That's right. That's right. We got to do some exercise. We got to do this. We got to do that. Yeah. And this is laid out for us. So if I can open that door and bring as many people with us, or as we say, get them on the ship, right? Back to our spirituality. Yeah. That was my purpose. And I get it. And, and it probably won't be the last time I do it. But this is definitely the first. Well, I am, I am excited, Brett, that, that you know, one, uh, this kind of thing really helps a, uh, Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay, ASEB, to get our, you know, we've been in the community for over 33 years now, and we're still struggling to get the bandwidth of funding that we need so that we don't have to continually, continually uh, go from, you know, uh, struggling to keep our doors open. But at the end of the day, 
we have kept our doors open. And so there's a victory I, in that. And yes. then people like you come along and say, I want to walk with you and beside you. I'm still trying to get Brett on our board as well. But you know, it, it just, all those things come together. That's the synergy of love. That's the synergy of acts of kindness. And yeah. so December 4th, Brett's going to be here sharing the long goodbye. We're going to have, we've got baskets coming in that it's where it's not going to be, um, auction, you're going to just buy raffle tickets and put them in the boxes. And then when you, when we call the raffle, you'll get to take the baskets home. We've got quilts, beautiful handmade quilts. We've got um, wine, uh, bottles of wine that you can be, uh, you know, raffle on. We also have vegan mob that is coming and, and we're going to yes. have the yeah. opportunity to eat that delicious, delicious. I've had it before. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, and we will have also some, uh, you know, things around. We're going to be making holiday. Um, what do you call those doohickey things that you hang on the tree? <laughs> The ornaments and all yes. of that kind of stuff. So I we can call them doohickeys. I think that's fair. That's a bit of a chopped up holiday. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good word. This and the Christmas doohickey. doohickey. We could do that. So December fourth, um, yep. we will be streaming some of it. So you will have an mm -hmm. opportunity um, to find us, and we'll figure that all out and get that all out to you. But donate. You know, the tickets are $50 for adults yeah. and, and we have a photo booth and all that, $20 for students. But at the end of the day, if you can't come, and I understand if you can't, or if you feel like you're not ready to come out and yeah. be outside, right. just go to the website and donate to ASEP during this holiday season, Please. during this time of gratitude. If you're on Amazon, Hook up to Amazon Smile and hit ASEB. So every time you order something, something yep. comes back to ASEB. If you have a cell phone that you're getting ready to replace, bring it to ASEB or, or let us know about it because we get them and take them to Pace Butler and they we may get money for them. There's so many ways that you can support. Brett has chosen to bring his time, talent, and treasure to ASEB on December 4th. And so we're very excited about that. We've uh, um, sent invitations out to all of our local politicians to see if we can get them or a representative to come. All we need is you. So right. right now, if you can't come, but you know somebody who wants to come, tell them to go online and get a ticket. Uh, if you can sponsor, whatever you can do. Um, but also give somebody the gift of the long goodbye. Buy it, purchase it, and give it away for the holiday season to a caregiver that you know is on the beginning of their journey, yeah. in the middle of their journey, or even if the journey is over for them and they're no longer caregiving. This is something that will help them in those moments. Grief is something that always pops up, my friends. I keep telling you. It's not something, it just changes with, from the beginning of it to when you live with it, you take it with you. When you lose someone you love, the reality is they've left an, an, uh, an, an, a mark on your heart and they live within you. So you will always feel the loss of them. I just told my daughter in the car this morning, for some reason, for the last three days, I have been on the verge of tears as it relates to my brother. I don't know why, but then I thought about it in the car. I'm like, yeah, you do. His birthday's coming up. Right. So, so. Your body prepares you. Yeah. yeah. So just yeah. live yes. in these beautiful moments. Brett said it. I, I have to tell you, we were created to grieve, we were created to cry, we were created to laugh, we were created to feel joy, we were created to listen actively and be intentional in relationships. That's what's happening here on December 4th, this intentional relationship between Brett and his dad, dad and Brett, grandfather ancestral men in the DNA, yeah. and then the relationship that he and I have because I didn't do anything. ASEB was just here in the community and we were here when he needed us. And then this relationship has grown into a sisterhood and a brotherhood that we will take into eternity. So that's what love looks like. That's what love looks like when it shows up, my friends. So show up for us. Show up for Alzheimer's Services of the East Bay. We need your love. I want to thank 
uh, uh, Stacy Current, whose birthday is coming up on the 21st. Happy birthday, my dear sister love. And she has a campaign on Facebook. She's trying to raise money for ASAP on behalf of her birthday. There's so many ways that you can support us. You can go to the Renaissance website. If you are a local business, uh, uh, a small business, or even just thinking about starting a business, Renaissance and Brett Sweet can help you do it in a way that you'll look back and say, I'm glad I went and got the wisdom that I need to, to live this journey of being an entrepreneur. It's not easy, my friends. Yes, there's uh, crying nights. There's nights where you're ripping your hair out, but there's joy in it when you overcome, but you need some tools. So go to Renaissance and get your toolbox so that you can make it through this journey and you can be successful, not in the way that society says, but the, sex, the success that you're envisioning in your heart. Renaissance can help you, Brett's Week can help you. So Brett, it's Friday, bro, it's Friday. And yeah, um, I wanna thank you so much for coming and I wanna thank you for wrapping your arms around Alzheimer services of the East Bay. Well, you guys wrapped it around me when I needed it, when I was and, a well, much frailer, confused, grieving version of myself. And, you know, and, you, and, and in retrospect, I think one of the things is, um, you know, I'll leave you with this is I think to your point, you know, some people I know, once they're lost a parent, they're done. They don't talk about it. They don't want to come back to it. That's just not my way. Yeah. Um, I know that there's other people I got to get through this passage. And so I think um, I remember Alzheimer's services being there when I needed it. And I didn't realize it took me 10 years to realize how badly I needed it. And I remember when we first connected, I was like, hey, I know you. I know. Right? I know. I was like, uh, and that's how crazy it is, right? How full circle it is. Yeah. Um, and so I can only imagine there's other people who don't have the support mechanisms I do. So I think one of the things I said, um, there's a song. It's like the second song and it's called Cliff, which is an acronym for can't live if father fails, right? Yeah. And so the thought was, sometimes when I rap, I ask if I'm the problem. If I tell you about my dad, I'm hoping I can solve it. Mm -hmm. Right? And so there's some part of this grief that I understand that the more I talk about it, as difficult as it is for me, I can, you know, somebody talked to me two weeks ago, a friend of a friend. And in this, and they told me they learned more about caregiving their parent in three hours than they have in three months of reading books. And so, you know, there's other aspects of this. I've been thinking about, you know, taking a note from you and my wife thinking about maybe I need to start setting up classes because it's just, really hard to pallet all this all at one time. There's, yep. there's a process of your brain that's still in the no, 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 no. Why is this happening? And so- um, Well, let's talk about that. I'd love to yeah, let's uh, go on out. the if road with you with that because that's my mantra. I think that we're too busy teaching people to live in doom and gloom and we need to always teach them the truth first, give them the truthful facts so they know what they're getting into, but yes. then help them to, to live through whatever, yes. instead of saying, oh, whoa, 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 all the time. That doesn't give me the energy to have hope. And Not at all. Up. And then you, why would you want to do anything? Because what is it? What are you looking forward to? And I think one of the things that a uh, credit to my brother, Julian, he said this very well, because we're also still caregiving my mother. Yeah, I know. He says, uh, this is a soft landing. That's our job. That's our job. Our job is to help this satellite land soft. Mm. Okay. And so I think people, context is everything. And so I think for me, when I needed it, when I was alone, when I didn't have anybody, ASAP wrapped their arms around me. Now it's my turn. All right. Well, we thank you for that. So everybody, it's Friday. Yep. Go out into the world and hug a tree. A tree <laughs> gives off so many. So if you hug it and hold on to it, and don't be embarrassed. I promise you, you're going to feel something that you've never felt before. And it's called life. It's called life. A living, breathing entity will share its essence with you. So go hug a tree. Pet a dog, pet a cat, whatever. Hug your wife, hug your husband, hug your daughter, your son, your cousin, your best friend, your neighbor, a stranger. It will ever change who you are in that very moment. That hug will change the way you feel about yourself and how you feel about humanity. So 
Have a good weekend. Be safe. Uh, Brett, sweet, I love you. I love and you. we will be together on December 4th. Come join the fun. We're going to have a ball. Yeah. And I think there's a special guest um, from the North Pole, I think, going to show up. So, uh, <laughs> so join us. Bring your kids. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. Brett, hold on one second. Um, we yep. love you here at Life is a Sacred Journey. Uh, Felicia, I would be remiss. Hit the share button. <laughs> Tell a friend, do whatever you need to do in your social network to help our social network grow. We love you for that. We're grateful to you and we'll see you soon. See you next week. Bye.